I think we're ready to start. My name is Chris Wetterland, and I'm the Director of Education here at the Corning Museum of Glass. Welcome, everybody, to our first lecture of the 2015 Behind the Glass Lecture Series. So I want to also welcome our online audience, because we are live streaming this talk tonight on our Ustream channel. And if you want to tell your friends about it later, it will also be recorded and available on our YouTube channel and on the museum's website. So we will have time for questions uh, at the end of the program. And you can tweet your questions uh, to the hashtags that are, you're looking at right now, if you're looking at our Ustream channel. And uh, we will uh, hopefully have time to answer all of them. Certainly, we'll get to some of them. The 2015 Behind the Glass Lecture Series promises to be a very exciting one. I hope you'll all come back and join us for lectures from artists and authors and scientists and to explore the history, the art, the study, and the science of glass. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce Laura Damon Moore and Aaron Page, our speakers for tonight's lecture. Laura Damon Moore has worked in public and academic libraries in Wisconsin and is currently the assistant director for the Eager Free Library, Public Library in Evansville, Wisconsin. I love that name, Eager Free Library. Erin Page is a poet as well as a librarian and moved from Wisconsin to become the programming, programming director at the New Canaan Library in New Canaan, Connecticut. The two of them together started the Library as Incubator Project, which they are going to tell us about. But its mission is to promote and facilitate the creative collaboration between libraries and artists of all types and to advocate for libraries as incubators of the arts. Out of that project grew a book, The Artist's Library, part inspiration for artists and librarians and part how-to manual for uh, librarians who want to collaborate with artists. Uh, you can purchase the book here tonight, right over there at the end of our program. And of course, if you're watching online, you can hop on over to Amazon and get it there, right? Um, the librarians here at the Reikau Research Library lent me a copy of this book. And when I read it, I knew we had to invite Laura and Erin to come and talk. We are in many ways living the library as incubator project here at the, the Corning Museum of Glass. Um, our Reikau Research Library serves as inspiration for many artists and students who work in our studio and artists who work in glass the world over. I had the great pleasure of introducing Laura and Erin to the Reikau Research Library this afternoon. And uh, I think you're going to see it appear in their talk tonight. So please join me in welcoming Laura Damon Moore and Aaron Page. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Hello. You um, can all come closer. <laughs> you just move down a couple of seats. We'll have a cozy Don't worry combo. <laughs> I am Laura Damon Moore, and this is my colleague, Erin Page, and together with an awesome team, we make up the Library as Incubator Project. It's such a pleasure um, to be with you all this evening. We have really been looking forward to our visit to the Corning Museum of Glass, and it's a real thrill to be in this space to talk with and learn from all of you tonight. Uh, before we go any farther, I want to give our sincere thanks to Chris, um, and, who reached out to us about this visit in the first place, and to Kara Smith, um, who coordinated our travel. And thank you also to Rebecca and Jim from the Reikau Research Library, um, and to all of the museum and library staff, and the artists and curators, and um, to all of you as well for making us feel so welcome here. There we go. Oh, that's us. That's who we are. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Right. So the Library as Incubator Project began as a one-credit independent study at the University of Wisconsin-Madison's School of Library and Information Studies in 2011. 
Since that time, um, we've been able to talk with over 500 artists, writers, performers, and library staff members about the fun, exciting intersection of the arts and libraries from many parts of the, U of the US and all over the world. The people that we talk to are professional artists, they're hobbyists, they're dilettantes. Uh, call them what you will. One thing that they have in common is that libraries of one kind or another have been an active part of their creative life and work. So as um, Chris said, we believe that the library is a place to connect and create. And our mission at the Libraries Incubator Project is to facilitate creative collaborations between librarians and artists to fuel that creative life, to make those connections possible. Um, that's what our virtual work is about on the site. That's what we do in real life when we come and give presentations like this, when we collaborate on grant projects for libraries around the country. Um, but I want to take a moment to talk about what we mean when we say the library as incubator. And to do that, I wanna talk a little bit about creativity, which I think all of you are sort of, that's part of your life, you're engaged in that. <laughs> so one of my heroes is Sir Kenneth Robinson. He wrote a book called The Element, and it explores the nature and origin of creativity by examining case studies of highly successful creative people, everything from dancers and musicians to writers to inventors and entrepreneurs. I really highly recommend looking up uh, Robinson's famous TED Talks online to learn more about his research and the impact of educational models on creativity because they're really inspiring. Um, but when we were sort of coalescing the idea of what the library's incubator concept meant, Robinson happened to be a speaker at the Wisconsin Science Festival. This was a few years ago. He argued in his presentation that our current education system, which focuses on achievement standards, ends up creating good workers, but not creative thinkers. And it's problematic because it can't acknowledge, value, or cultivate the many different kinds of intelligence. In his lecture at the festival, he shared a picture of creativity that helped us crystallize our own conception of library as incubator. And I wanna share what these basic aspects were. So he said that creativity needs to be encouraged at the very moment when the structure of our education system is discouraging it. Creativity is not for a special group of people. It's inherent in everyone. It's like musculature, right? And a bodybuilder works that out, and a couch potato does not. But it doesn't mean they don't have muscles, right? They're there, it's part of your system. Creativity is a process. It's a process that can be taught, and it can be learned. And finally, cultivating a space for creativity is essentially about climate control. If you can provide the right circumstances the right opportunity and the right attitude, creativity has a chance. So based on these ideas, we expanded our definition of artist for the purposes of our site and for the purposes of our book that we're talking about tonight to include anyone who uses a creative process and physical or digital tools to make something new. So that's a very expansive view of what an artist is, but it was useful to us because what we're considering is supporting a creative life and how a library can do that. And that's a very egalitarian place to come from. Everybody could do that. So when we wrote our book, The Artist Library, we had these ideas in mind, what it takes to nurture creativity and the library as a space that's well suited to the job. So as the Incubator Project grew, um, sort of starting as this little website where we would post cool stories about artists and libraries um, to this steadily growing social media empire, uh -huh. um, we 
the um, Aaron and our co-founder, Christina, and I would daydream from time to time um, because people would sort of ask, well, what do you envision as the, for the next step? What's the next step in your project's process? And, um, and writing a book always sort of was percolating there under the, under the surface. Um, we wanted to write a book that would highlight the conversations we were having with artists and others on our website. And you can't blame us, right? Um, even though we have a website with lots of readers, there's still something about a book. <laughs> it smells good. It smells good. You can hold it and flip the pages. Oh, it's very pleasing. I'm probably preaching to the choir here. Ever since the Incubators Project earliest days, we had been talking with Coffee House Press, which is a small independent publishing company in Minneapolis, about a potential collaboration. So when Coffee House invited the three of us up to the Twin Cities in the summer of 2012, Aaron and I spent the whole car ride up brainstorming an outline for a book that would be part anthology part how-to on integrating one's library into one's creative process. And luckily for us, the awesome staff at Coffee House Press had a similar project in mind, and we found our, ourselves moving quite quickly through the book, book production process. And what came out of that is the artist's library, a field guide. With the printed format, we were able to explore the content from our website in a new way and break down some of the major ways that artists use libraries in their creative work. We thought it would be fun to share some examples with you tonight from the book, but also newer examples that have come to us over the last couple of years. And um, I just want to note that the images you're seeing up here are artists who were featured in our book. Um, so this is um, a project by Cheryl Sorg, is the giant thumbprint you see up there. Um, she's an artist who takes personalized uh, book portraits, basically, of people. So she, I think, takes thumbprints mm -hmm. and then uses people's thumbprints to fill in with their favorite books magazines, stuff like that, to create um, these large-scale works of um, mixed-media art. So it's like what you read becomes your identity. It's really wonderful. <laughs> she has, she has a, a pretty incredible piece right now in the Odd Volumes exhibition okay. at um, the Yale Art Gallery. It's the first thing you see when you walk in. And it, it was featured on our site about two years before she, was, um, she got the deal um, to show there. And it's an 11 foot, she calls it a bookwork. It's the 11 foot spiral. She cut apart two copies of Moby Dick, word by word, and reassembled it in a spiral from Call Me Ishmael all the way out to the final, th it's 11 feet wide. And she reconstructed this with tape. And it's astonishing, like it's beautiful, it's, it's the, uh, it's the flagship piece in that show right now. Um, and several of the artists that, that we've been able to interview over the last few years are in that show. So if you have like spare five hours to drive <laughs> to Yale, we, recommend um, we highly recommend it because it's, it's kind of awesome. You can say hello to me because that's where I live. <laughs> All right, and then um, we have some doodles um, based on children's literature by Dan Augustine, who's one of those, um, he has a day job um, as an editor, but he does these, uh, he says that they're not drawings, they're just doodles um, on, the, on the side. So he's also featured in our book. Um, and then this fold by book artist um, Carol Chase Bierke, who's from the Madison area and um, was one of the first artists we featured on the site. So I'm going to hit some examples in a little bit more depth. Chapter one of the artist library um, explores the library it itself as a subject, um, as an institution, as a physical space, as a social space, all of which can inspire and motivate great art. So we take a look at how libraries, both grand and sort of pedestrian or practical, are part of this long-standing story of, of human knowledge and experience. 
So the world over, architects have designed libraries to, to communicate the incredible power of knowledge, right? And, and what they design reflects what's inside. Um, our example here is photog a photographer who deliberately uses vintage film and vintage cameras, we're talking like brownie cameras, um, and vintage developing processes to document these libraries around the country. Her name's Jamie Powell Shepard, and she has uh, a series called The Libraries Project, which you can also see online, and I highly recommend it. It's quite beautiful. And the point of it is to capture the unexpected, to sort of force viewers to appreciate the library not only as architecture, but also as this often overlooked force for good in a community that really should be preserved. Her work goes beyond composition. It goes beyond just finding a beautiful way to present something on film and, and looks at a larger social narrative of libraries and the people who use them. And it actually began when she was working at a library in Tennessee when she was experiencing photographer's block. She hadn't actually like taken a picture that she cared about in a really long time. And she just started photographing the libraries in her consortium because she was like, I'm just gonna take pictures until something hits me. <laughs> and, you know, she was in Louisville, Louisville and she was um, just taking these pictures and she encountered her first Carnegie Library as a piece of architecture, as this space. And she started taking pictures of it and she realized she was completely smitten. So. Here's a, here's a quote from our uh, interview with her. She says, part of my desire for the libraries project is to document these graceful buildings before we lose them forever. But I also want people to rediscover them. I believe that if we could show people their libraries from a different perspective, they'd develop pride and be less willing to lose such a gift. Hmm? Sorry. Wendy McNaughton also uses the library space as an inspiration, but in a different way. Wendy's an illustrator and a graphic journalist who's based in San Francisco, and her series, Meanwhile, San Francisco, in its own words, chronicles places, people, and moments in her city. This illustration is from a sub-project that's part of Meanwhile called San Francisco Public Library, in its own words, which was originally published on the rumpus in 2011. For each story, Wendy puts, about a, puts in about a month with a particular community that's overlooked in the city. She gets to know them, she observes them, she talks to and interviews them, and she draws them. And then she takes those drawings and all of their stories and she puts them together to form a broader narrative about their place in San Francisco, their place in the community. And her impetus for San Francisco Public Library, in its own words, was to capture the story of the library through the people who frequent it. And here's a great quote from her about how the project developed. The story that revealed itself was not at all what I expected. I thought I'd be doing a story about the library being a public knowledge bank, how it provides a temporary shelter for those in need, both of which are true but I had no idea that the library was such a social hub, that it provided such services beyond information. What I found was much more than what I expected. I really love this example because it highlights how Wendy herself, as an artist and a journalist, became part of that social hub that she was documenting. She was part of that e ecosystem. The library space and the people were inspiring to her. They were giving her something to draw and talk about, but she became something of a fixture there as well. She would walk up to people and they would be kind of like, why are you carrying around pencils? Why are you drawing me? And then after a while, she was there all the time and you know, she would walk up to people smiling and want to know about their day. And they started to find her when she came and tell her their stories. So we've talked with many artists who use the stuff they access in libraries as inspiration for creative projects. This stuff includes books, but also music and images, videos, 
and it may be found as tangible objects or online as digital materials. Um, up here, you see an example that was created by designer and visual artist Chu Chia Chi for um, a program called the Art Trail at the Edinburgh Central Library in Edinburgh, Scotland. This was an outgrowth um, of a collaboration between the Central Library and um, the Edinburgh School of Art and Design. And design students were actually invited into the library to explore collections that don't get a lot of um, customer facing um, time. So um, a lot of archival materials, um, historic materials uh, that relate directly to Scotland and Edinburgh history and things like that. And then all of the students were invited to create new works of art based on the collections and the materials that they found in the library. The finished pieces were then installed throughout the central library to create an interactive exploratory art trail that library patrons could um, tour through the library spaces and view all of these new original artworks that were based on library collections. Okay. <laughs> Kevin Weir is an artist we just featured on the website this fall. He's a graphic designer in New York City, and he's the amateur animator behind the website Flux Machine. Highly recommend taking a look at it. He creates these mini animated GIFs using digitized photos from the Library of Congress's Flickr stream. And he says that he checks the stream occasionally to see the new batch of photos when they're posted. And he seeks out ones that look particularly intriguing for his animation projects. And I think this is such a great way to expose a whole new set of viewers um, and browsers to these historic photos, which might seem commonplace at first and then become very uh, strange and unusual the longer that you look at them. Um, in this line, I'd also like to encourage you to explore the Digital uh, Public Library of America's recent GIF making contest, uh, wherein they invited GIF makers of all experience levels to explore their holdings and create animations based on digitized historic photos. Okay. All right. Um, our next artist who uses library collections in her work is filmmaker Josephine Decker. For her short film, Me the Terrible, which has been shown at film festivals around the country, Josephine used archival sound recordings she found of old radio and television shows. Um, and television news programs. We're going to watch a clip from this video. It's about 11 minutes long. We'll just watch about four minutes of it. Um, so please listen to the richness of this film when the audio backdrop is placed behind this contemporary visual. Traveling pirate with her ever trusty sidekick Teddy sets out to conquer Manhattan Island. But will the Big Apple take a bite out of? Central Park, and then we're gonna pull it all of New York City. 
Thanks, Jason. <laughs> okay, yay. We come to the Raquel Research Library. Yay. <laughs> um, special thank you to Rebecca Hopman for supplying the images for this particular slide. Um, so we were incredibly excited today to find this sort of interesting artist library collaboration um, that's taking place right here at the Corning Museum of Glass with its wonderful Raycow Research Library. The collections here are archival, which means that they don't get weeded and that the point of them is to preserve a moment in the history of glass making, production, glass design. And we were so impressed by the efforts of Rebecca and library staff to connect the collections to the hands-on instruction that happens here and to support artists and their creative goals. So creative project research um, that can grow out of collaborations like this is something that we're particularly interested in. And chapter three of the artist library looks at how artists can use the library in that way, in a really in-depth sort of um, mesh of academic and creative pursuits. We don't see these things as separate. We see them as having a certain slide between them into the studio and back into the reading room. Um, so Nicola Dixon, uh, who uh, works as an artist in Australia, uses in-depth research into the historical collections at the National Library in Canberra to inform her work. To her, libraries are cultural institutions where people can both factually and imaginatively explore the past. This particular image is drawn from her Wedgwood Blue series, which was inspired by a series of Jasperware medallions that were in the library's collection. 
The originals were made to commemorate the voyage of Captain Cook and the scientific records that were made during his exploratory voyage to Australia and Tasmania. This had a huge historical impact. Those written and visual records that you know, eventually came to Britain and Europe fueled imperial expansion and the colonization of Australia, which has shaped it as a nation. And Nicola uses that imagery. She appropriates those, um, those visuals of those Jasper Ware medallions to comment on contemporary notions of Australia as a place, which is often exoticized. As she puts it, my drawings refer to the fact that the wonder of novel plants, animals, and people became part of how Europeans interacted with indigenous peoples. They're meant to remind the viewer of the contested nature of Australian history. So she uses old imagery to create a new commentary on, on what's happening there politically, what's happening there in terms of um, different ethnicities um, and that kind of thing. Another example that's coming to us from Australia is coming from the State Library of Victoria. And there, there's this incredible staff fellowship program that gives one staff member each year the time and support to work on a project that will advance their creative work and promote the library's rich resources. So it does two things at once. Fellows are provided with an office a separate office. They're free from all their other work duties for the duration of the project, and the project will last anywhere from one to three months. Dominique Dunstan is our example here, and she used her fellowship to research the library's landmark natural history resources around the flora and fauna of Australia. And she reimagined those images and facts that she learned in a series of beautiful drawings done on whiteboards with whiteboard markers. I am not kidding. <laughs> There's a pretty amazing um, series of photographs on our website that, that show how she did it. And she layered colors in order to get them to look as beautiful as the images she was working from. Um, and these were whiteboards that were in office spaces and in workspaces throughout the library. So not only did this project reinvent the resources that were part of the collection, these natural history tomes, and brought them to life in workspaces and in the rest of the library, um, it also gave Dominique a much richer and nuanced personal understanding of the collections when she returned to her work as a reference librarian. She had approached them from a completely different standpoint. She wasn't working on anybody else's research. She was finding things that were evocative, that she could transform into images that people could interact with in their workspaces. Um, and it was a completely different experience. Um, about her fellowship, she says, that the library encourages scholarly and literary use of the collection is, in this way is wonderful, and one might expect that. That the library welcomes and supports artists takes things to another level. I think it's visionary. It promotes and celebrates creativity, imagination, and innovation across disciplines and expands our perception of libraries not just as repositories, but engines of cultural production and activity. The way we record and express our history and culture is evolving so quickly. The collaboration of artists and libraries seems a perfect relationship for capturing this process and gives it meaning in a way that can be shared far and wide. So um, one of the later chapters in our book explores how some artists use the library as an arts venue, a place to perform. And I loved um, talking with one of the artists in particular, uh, Brandon Minokian, who is a director and actor who works in New Jersey and New York City. And um, 
when we were talking with him, he commented that he never thought of working in spaces outside of traditional theaters when he was working on his, um, you know, his acting major and stuff like that, but that the interesting challenges that are posed by a library, uh, by its very nature, a public thoroughfare, usually with no traditional stage or performance, performance space um, makes performing and staging work that much more exciting and engaging for the performers and also for the audience who find this uh, performance happening in their space. So um, one of the examples that we wanted to highlight was Kristen Hammergren. She's up here. She wrote a one-woman show called Discovering Austin which is about a young actress preparing to go on stage to perform as Jane Austen in a new play. And the script weaves historical documents, including letters by Austen herself, with passages from the novels she wrote. And this blend of literature and history makes Discovering Austen a particularly intriguing show to present in a library which Kristen has done in libraries around the Midwest. So it's not only theater performances that take place in libraries. Last year, we heard from Sands Point Dance Company, which is based in Alabama, and their modern performance series, Life on a Shelf, which is a set of four performances, each inspired by a different kind of library book children's books, which you can see up here, poetry, nonfiction, and reference materials. This was, as they said, their thank you note to all of the public libraries who had inspired and helped them over the years. That's the tearjerker for the evening. <laughs> Oops. Down. Um, so one thing that we also wanted to talk about today is a program. We get inspired by the programs that we hear about happening in libraries all over the country and around the world. And so we decided that we wanted to do one of our own. Um, so we created a sister project um, in addition to the Library as Incubator project called the Book to Art Club. And it's sort of what you would imagine. Um, it's a book and art making club that exists virtually online and in person at libraries um, around the world at this point. Um, so what we wanted to do was to um, sort of create um, a story time for grown-ups opportunity. Um, we wanted to take the traditional model of a book club um, that so many libraries employ as part of their programming um, and that a lot of people are very comfortable with and incorporate a creative side to it. So we invite people to explore the titles um, that we have in the, art, the Book to Art Club catalog um, through hands-on projects. Um, everything from, you know, the little uh, frog sketches you see up here, which were, was an explana exploration of Chasing Vermeer, which is a juvenile novel, actually, um, and embroidery and beadwork and um, a whole range of create, creative projects. It's a, it's a really interesting project, I think, um, and what we've seen is that people engage with the book for the book club differently when they know they're going to have to make something. Make something based on it. <laughs> <coughs> and you don't have to have any like formal training as an artist. You don't need to be an artist to sketch something out. Um, you know, sometimes people will create mood boards mm -hmm. to represent a book, how it made them feel or the setting, you know, and they'll cut apart um, paint chips and say, this is the, this is the, these are the colors that are happening for this story, right? And that doesn't take anything but scissors and glue. But the thought process behind it of really engaging with the senses that are evoked when you're reading and making them real on the page 
has been a really interesting spur for conversation Absolutely. and a different kind of conversation about stories. And what we've seen that's been really neat with this project as well is that it's um, cross-generational. So we have school libraries who are engaging with this project, um, public libraries, and a lot of um, community colleges and um, other academic institutions as well. So it's been um, really fun and I encourage you to explore if you're interested in learning more. So this may be old hat for some of you who are coming directly from the Corning Museum of Glass, but if you're coming from a public library, if you're coming from another setting, if you just want to sort of reframe how to connect, um, we offer these sorts of, of baseline jumping off points that we've come to in all of our conversations about how to connect the library as a space with artists as a creative community and see how these things can feed each other and support one another. Reaching out is step one, making sure that artists know that your space is the space that's for them. Um, and that can be a challenge a little bit um, because most people think libraries and think books. They don't think making, but they, sh they shouldn't have to rely on just that. Realigning services every once in a while to sort of correspond with the creative process. And once you've reached out and make some connections, that's an easy thing to do. You know, what, what do you need out of us? What would your ideal library look like? Three things that artists often tell us. We, we ask this question in every interview that we do is, what does your ideal library look like? Artists want 24 hours. They want to open at 3 AM when they have an inspiration. That may or may not be feasible. Yeah. You may wish to market digital collections that are available at 3 AM. The 3 AM library. Yes. They want large work tables. They want lots of natural light. And some of them would like a speakeasy in the basement. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> Food for thought. Food for thought. And then educate and advocate for libraries as places to share and connect and create information as well as consume it. I think one of the biggest takeaways that we have come to after talking with successful collaborators who are living the library's incubator idea is seeing information as a life cycle. It starts with you know, where, wherever you get it, whether that's digital collections or books, however you take that in. And then being able to make something new with it that can then turn around and teach somebody else. So that these processes of taking in information, having access to it, and transforming it into new information is this constant flow. And being a part of that and seeing it as alive and dynamic and changing. And that's something that um, library staff can do and do do <laughs> um, frequently, but um, I think that's a fantastic opportunity for members of the community as well to educate and advocate um, for libraries as these creative spaces too. Right. Uh, Okay, so um, we like to end our presentations um, with a what we call the sexy library poem. Um, this is in our Exploring the Library as Subject chapter. Um, this is a poem written by Joseph Mills, who is a library lover and poet. And he just sent us this poem out of the blue one day and said, I wrote this a couple of years ago, thought you might enjoy it. And um, it's been- It blew up Twitter. Yeah, yeah, it's been one of the most popular things that we've ever posted. <laughs> if librarians were honest. A book indeed sometimes debauched me from my work. Benjamin Franklin. If librarians were honest, they wouldn't smile or act welcoming. They would say, you need to be careful. Here be monsters. They would say, these rooms house heathens and heretics, murderers and maniacs, 
the deluded, desperate, and dissolute. They would say, these books contain knowledge of death, desire, and decay, betrayal, blood, and more blood. Each is a Pandora's box, so why would you want to open one? They would post danger signs, warning that contact might result in mood swings, severe changes in vision, and mind-altering effects. If librarians were honest, they would admit the stacks can be more seductive and shocking than porn. After all, once you've seen a few breasts, vaginas, and penises, more is simply more, a comforting banality. But the shelves of a library contain sensational novelties, a scandalous, permissive mingling of Malcolm X, Marx, Melville, Merwin, Millay, Milton, Morrison, and anyone can check them out taking them home or to some corner where they can be debauched and impregnated with ideas. If librarians were honest, they would say, no one spends time here without being changed. Maybe you should go home while you still can. So we want to invite all of you to participate in our conversation about arts and libraries and the important, vital ways that artists and librarians can work together to make their communities vibrant. If you didn't know us before today, we invite you to explore our website and our social media neighborhoods. If you did know us before today, we invite your stories, your ideas, and your questions. Um, as must be very clear, the incubator project would not be possible and would not be nearly as useful or fun uh, without participation from people like you. So thank you for that. Oh, oh we are awesome at time. Look at that. We are awesome at time. <laughs> <laughs>